Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the second Integrable Probability Seminar for this semester. Um, today, Maurice Duitz will be speaking about central limit, uh, central limit theorems for biorthogonal ensembles beyond the strong Sago limit theorem. I believe uh, you're going to do sort of half your talk, take a break, and then the other remainder. Um, yes, yes. Yeah. Split it into it. Okay. So this should be a, about an hour and a half talk split into roughly like 40 minute halves or something like this. Okay, cool. So let's welcome. Okay, okay thank you. Um, great pleasure to, uh, to speak at your seminar. Um, it's a pity I cannot come to New York for that, but uh, uh, it's a pleasure to, to be here virtually. So what I will speak about uh, is indeed about CLTs for biothermal ensembles uh, beyond the strong Sager limit theorem. Uh, my talk will indeed be two parts. And in the first part, I will discuss, uh, give some overview of results on some um, concepts that we have been working on in, in, a, in, a, in, in, in various, I mean, in already in a longer time. So I will also recall some results that maybe you already have seen. Uh, but for those of you that already have seen it, I apologize. I try to present it in a way that uh, it's still giving in some way. Um, and then the second part, I want to talk about some recent work with Benjamin Fass and Rostislav Kozan on multiple orthogonal polynomial ensembles, uh, where some new features come in that I think are, are quite interesting. Um, okay, so I will start off with the first part, and then after the first part is, is done, uh, I will take a short break. I think it's a five-minute break, is that, is that correct, or something like that? Look. Yeah, um, whatever you'd like, yeah. What, okay, great. And, uh, and then I will continue with the second part. Okay, so the first part, I'll just say a few things about a, 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 a simple to state sort of problem. Um, and it is the following. So many of the problems that I will speak, speak about uh, later on in the first part can basically be reduced to the following simple problem, or well, simply to state. So you start with some uh, matrix B, which is an infinite matrix. And then you take the exponential of B, which is of course also a infinite matrix. And I will assume here that uh, B is maybe bounded or although actually also unbounded situations will be considered. Let's not worry about this now. So we can take the exponential and again, we get an infinite matrix and we cut this matrix into four parts. And we look at the uh, sort of the truncated part here, which is size n by m. Okay, so when I look just at this part, and then what I want to study is basically the, I will call it with phi and b, this is the determinant of the matrix e to the b. And now when j and k run from one to n. And what I particularly want to study is uh, what is the behavior of phi n of b uh, when uh, when n grows large, okay. So um, so this is a very general setup. Um, now, if I don't have any more conditions on B, then it will be a, a rather silly problem. But actually, you can already say quite a few interesting things um, in a general setup. If you only assume that B B is basically, let's say B is sort of diagonally dominant. Of course, if B is a diagonal, the whole problem is trivial. Uh, but if, D, if B is a matrix that is maybe not diag diagonal, but, but most of the uh, mass of, the, so to speak, of the entries are along the diagonal, then actually this phi and B has certain properties and the asymptotic behavior has certain properties that already have universal features. And this is actually what lies behind some central limit theorems for biothermal ensembles. Uh, and, and I would like to explain that. Okay, so now before I come to, to any general statements, let me just let me just say a little bit of of of, of a strategy or like a motivation. Like let me consider two examples as a motivation that lead to this problem. So the first of all, the first example is that of the eigenvalues of a CUE matrix, which I think here in this audience are are very well studied already. So let's e to the i theta j be the eigenvalues uh, 
of a CUE and matrix. Okay. And what you want could study, one of the things you can study for, for, for such an ensemble is the so-called linear statistics, uh, where you take a function f, which is sufficiently smooth, and then you evaluate your function in the, in the random points, in the random eigenvalues. So, so f here will be sufficiently smooth. And one of the nice things about this linear statistic is that it satisfies a central limit theorem. Um, I think this is quite well known. Uh, I want to just state it here to recall it. It's my Friday evening, so I have to start off a little bit easier. Uh, the central limit theorem says that if you would subtract the mean of this linear statistic, then this would converge to a normally distributed random variable where the variance is given by f hat k squared, the Fourier coefficients. But then there is also a k in front of it. We have a k here. So it's sort of a half sub f norm of f. Okay, so this is a very beautiful and remarkable result. Uh, one of the, of course, the key features of the CLT is that the variance remains bounded. So you don't have to normalize by the variance. And actually, despite you are not for, are, despite the fact that you are not normalized by the variance, you actually get a CLT. Uh, it's a bit strange why we get still a Gaussian law, but, but okay, that, that is a, that is just how it is. I think that this is a well-known result in this audience. Now, one way of proving this result is it was an observation that was, I think, originally to, to the Johansson, who says that actually, if you look at the characteristic function of such a linear statistic, then, then you can actually consider the, kind of express this as a determinant of a Toeplitz matrix. So here we have a matrix uh, that is con constructed out of the Fourier coefficients um, of the function e to the itf. So that's the function you take, and you compute the Fourier coefficients, and then you get j minus k and j and k run from one to n. So it's the Fourier, it's the Toeplitz matrix with a symbol e to the itf. Well, once you have this, and this is not so difficult to, to see, it's a standard identity, then you can invoke the strong Seiko limit theorem, uh, who says that this actually is just nothing else than exponential of n times i t times the f hat of zero uh, minus, for, sorry, minus t squared over two times the sum of k times f k hat squared. Okay, it's running from one to infinity. And here we get a one plus O of one. And this, uh, this is a classical result, strong Seiko limit theorem that gives you immediately the central limit theorem clearly. Okay, so the central limit theorem for the CUE, for linear statistics of the CUE, uh, can be just reduced to computing the asymptotics of a determinant, which already is well known in the literature. Now, the goal of this, of this actually the whole story, uh, how, how it started, was actually the desire to have such a proof also for other types of linear statistics and other types of random matrix models or models of integrable probability. So for example, now I already here, I cheated a little bit. I already drew this before. I guess this is an example that is very well known. Here we have a hexagon. A regular hexagon, so well, let's take these sides here to be n, this also to be n, and let's also take this here n, so it's all equal sides here. And you're going to take the hexagon, you're going to tile this with lozenges of these three types, um, and then you take a random measure on that. And let's say for the purpose of this talk, it doesn't really matter, I will not speak so much about it, but let's say that we take uh, the, the probability of a given tiling proportional to a Q to the volume, right? So the volume here is just the, the volume of the boxes, the number of boxes that are stacked in the corner as a three-dimensional model. Right? You see this as a corner of the room, you stack boxes in that corner, and then you say, well, the probability of having a certain configuration is proportional to the Q to the volume of this, uh, of this configuration. Okay, now, then you know that if N times, if, if you now take the limit that the, the capital N goes to infinity uh, and Q goes to one simultaneously, we know that there is a limit shape appearing, right? So actually, if you precisely, if you would take the limit N to infinity, but you set it such that N times the log of Q 
uh, Qn converges to a minus C, where this is a strictly, sorry, this is a non-positive uh, uh, constant, then actually there will be a limit shape appearing. And the conjecture is that there is a Gaussian free field uh, describing the fluctuations around this limit shape. Now, actually, such a statement you can also prove by, uh, by considering determinants of certain operators. And this brings me later also to this question. So, so what you actually, so let me first state the theorem. Um, suppose you would look at this model and you, you, instead of looking, I mean, how do you analyze it? Well, one way to do that is introduce a point process. So I will draw some points on lozenges of these type, but none of those. Then I have a number of points and then I can look at linear statistics again uh, that say, well, there is some M is one to capital N here. Uh, oh, yes. And then here also J is one to N of FM of XJM. And what I mean here is that, well, this is sort of the M direction. And this is the X direction. So these are the, so the XJM are the X coordinates at level M of these, of these points. Okay, if you do that, then you can actually prove, and this is something you can do with the methods that I, uh, uh, I, will, I, will, I will discuss today. In distribution, this also con converges to some normally distributed random law where the variance is a bit more complicated as before. as this log correlated structure that is sort of hiding in the variance also. Uh, you can prove this. Um, and you can actually prove this using some sort of analog of the strong Segur limit theorem, okay? And this is what I want to actually want to discuss today. So, so, so that is sort of my motivation for this entire project that we started several years ago, is to actually prove such statements using determinants of operators. Instead of looking at correlation kernels, which you can also do, of course, but this I don't want to do, okay? So that was sort of the, the point of the, the starting point of this, of this, um, of this, of this thing. Okay, so how is the connection now to, to, to these determinants? Um, well, that brings me to my uh, third fact. What I will do today is I will actually not so much look at two dimensional systems because it just gets a bit more complicated, but everything I can say can be generalized to two dimensional systems. So don't worry, this, this statement you can prove for the Q to the volume limit. You can actually prove that using the methods. Uh, but I want to just start now at biothogonal ensembles, just to illustrate the idea. So we look at biothogonal ensembles. So these are probability measures, right, on configurations of points. So we have a GPDF on, on X1 to Xn, which has a particular form um, of the form uh, 1 over n factorial times the determinant of phi j of x k, uh, j and k run from one to n, and also have a second determinant then. Uh, with, now with some new functions, it would be different from the phi's that I had in my first one. Uh, and also there is a measure mu uh, involved. And we will assume that these functions are such that the integral of phi j of x, uh, psi k of x, d mu x, uh, that they are normalized and orthogonal, uh, orthogonal and normalized. So this is just the delta of jk. So it's zero if j is different from k, and it's one if j is equal to k. Okay, so now you, this is just a biothermal ensemble. I mean, this, this, the CUE is, a, is a, obviously a case, a special case of that. Uh, another case is, for example, if I would look at a slice of those points, a vertical slice, then they also form a biothermal ensemble. And I think that this is well known in this audience. Now, if you want to study the linear statistics for such a biothermal ensemble, then you actually have to consider um, this kind of, you could consider this kind of, of expressions, the moment generating function, a plus transform, or sorry, the Fourier transform of the, of, of the linear statistic. Oh, I write an N there, this should be of course an F. And now you can just buy the same way you can get sort of to a template determinant, you can get here also to a determinant. This is a determinant of the matrix that is just e to the it f of x times the phi j of x 
times the psi k of x, d mu of x. And j and k here run from one to n. So what you see here is that indeed, directly, this is very easy to prove. It's just, um, the, it's just um, uh, the Andreas identity, basically. You can write this immediately as, as a determinant. And actually, what you could even do is that you write this as a determinant of this e to the i t, sorry, e to the b here. And now just the k j k is one to n. If you take uh, b is i t to the f j, and j is the matrix, uh, j k matrix that is constructed out of uh, x times the phi j of x times the psi k of x, the mu of x. So actually here, I assume also that my biorthogonal families are actually infinitely. We actually have this, we have an infinite family here, zero, one, two, two, and so on to infinity, like orthogonal polynomials, we have them from all degrees, although we only take here um, uh, the first n in the biorthogonal set. So I'll actually just complete this so that it's sort of like a, a real basis in our space. And then you can actually do this trick and you can write it in that form. Okay, uh, when, so this is you, a- Can I ask a question? Sure, yeah. So, so when you apply F to, to a matrix, you just apply it coordinate wise? So, so uh, F, F of a matrix is just apply F to each coordinate of, of the J matrix? No, no, it's it's F here could, I mean, F will be typically be kind of maybe a, a polynomial. So you just take the polynomial of a, of a matrix. Oh. So B squared, uh, B cubed and so on. You're uh, hanging, I think. Okay, so F here, we will see here, actual mentions it, but you, you should think F is a polynomial. Okay, so, okay, I'll, I'll continue. If you have the question still, then you can ask me, uh, you're, you're hanging, I think, so. Okay, so, so, so that is the idea how, how, how this comes about, that you, if you, this, 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 this Fourier transform of the linear statistic is basically just the determinant of a matrix, okay? Uh, uh, Maurice, uh, yeah, if, yeah. if uh, psi j was equal to uh, phi j, right, then your matrix would be symmetric? And you yes. could assume f to be from uh, you could get the whole fun functional calculus, right? So, yes. yeah. uh, so then, uh, do you have results for more general f in that case? Sure, yeah. Yeah. If, yes, if yes. Okay. Yes, yes. Yeah. I, I, I can. Uh, I, I will say maybe I'll just come up directly with some examples. So, for example, one example is of course the uh, uh, the Coulomb gases, right? Just the unitary ensembles. Here in this case, we have really orthogonal polynomials, right? So then, uh, then in fact, uh, we have that uh, our our J matrix here is just uh, the Jacobi matrix as, that has the spectral measure mu, right? So that's sort of filled with the recurrence coefficients. Um, let me start like that. Uh, B two and so on. So it's just a tridiagonal matrix. Um, out with the, uh, which is the Jacobi matrix for which the spectral measure is mu and containing the recurrence coefficients. And then you can do two things. So, so, so one thing that you can do is uh, you look at F polynomial, but, uh, but, but then you can also look at F is for example, uh, is like one over Z minus X or something like that. You look at the resolvent, uh, the imaginary part or like linear combinations of different Z. And this actually, what is nice about polynomials is that it gives you sort of CLT and, and sort of global information or macroscopic information. But these these uh, these other, uh, if you look at the Green's function, you can actually let Z, Z go approach the real line and you can get sort of mesoscopic uh, scales. And this is also something that we have studied. So so this would be a case here that I've studied with, with, with Jonathan Boyer. Uh, some time ago, and then actually this mesoscopics case, this this we have studied uh, some time ago, uh, but in a later paper, M14, and then so, and then the question is, of course, how how bad can you have be? Uh, well, 
yeah, that's an interesting question, of course. And we need always some smoothness of F because we are looking at linear statistics. If there were jump discontinuities, you would get, of course, uh, no CLTs, which what I'm after now. You get different CLTs of a different type because you will have a growing variance. So this, these are not so much the questions that I'm now after uh, in this talk. Okay, um, so I mean, there are more examples. Another example is, for example, if you would do this um, exactly the same thing, uh, but now on the unit circle, uh, then you can also do it. Uh, then you're actually, your, 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 your matrix J now is already a J, it's the C, it's like a CMV matrix. Uh, and this has also been studied. And then you actually can allow quite general uh, functions F. Um, and this was studied by myself with Kojan uh, some years ago in 2016. Um, then there is also another thing, and this is something that I want to speak about in the second part. This is the MLP ensembles. And what these are exactly I want to speak about uh, after in, in, in the second part. So then there will also be some more, actually some new interesting things appearing there that are, uh, that are fascinating, I think. Uh, but in any case, like these are good examples to keep in mind. I mean, here you have a Jacobi matrix, which is tridiagonal. This is what I meant with diagonal, uh, the diagonally dominant. Now, either you take the polynomial or you take the resolvent. In both cases, the resulting matrix is still diagonally dominant. Then you take an exponential of a diagonally dominant matrix, and then you ask what is the asymptotics of that. Okay, so let me go then to maybe some uh, some 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 general results. Some general results. So there are two results that here are that are very interesting, I think. Um, so the theorem A says the following. If your matrix B can be decomposed, let also say that B is one-sided banded. Actually, I should say that. Uh, that's the that's that's an that's an assumption that will work for us today quite well. That B is one-sided banded, but the other side could actually can can have full can be fully filled. So at the only one side it's banded. Doesn't matter which side. Now, if B could be decomposed as a B plus plus a B minus, uh, such that uh, one, the, the B plus and the B minus are upper triangular and lower triangular. What does one-sided banded mean? Sorry. So one-sided banded is just that you have a matrix B. Uh, so it basically means, well, here's a diagonal. There is there's somewhere another line and everything here is could be filled, but Oh, okay. Above that line is zero. So it's 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 a one-sided, sort of like only on one side there is a cutoff. Yeah. Then the second um, uh, property is that the B plus with the B minus, if you look at the commutator of this, that this should be trace class. Okay, so if you're not comfortable with trace class, you can also just think finite rank, because often it's actually finite rank. But Let's say uh, we have these two properties. Then you can actually prove, and this is the first sort of generalization of the strong, well, variation to a uh, strong Sabian limit theorem, so that this determinant e to the b j k actually has an expansion. It's e the exponential of the sum of b j j. J is running from one to n plus a half. Oops, yes, a half times the trace of this commutator, B plus times B minus. And then there is small terms. Okay, so this is, uh, should be compared with this strong signal limit theorem. Here you have a term that is like linear in B. Uh, and this is sort of the mean of, the, of your linear statistic. This is your, your, your mean density. And then we have a quadratic term, which is going to be the variance of your linear statistics. So your, your variance can actually be expressed as a trace of commutator, which is kind of a neat statement. Okay, so, so, so this is a statement and actually it's, if you would, maybe it's good to take immediately example of that statement. 
one way of 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 making an example is exactly by, by looking at a Toeplitz matrix T of A, which is Toeplitz matrix A zero and so on, and A1 on these diagonals, and so on, and A minus one, and so on, on this one, and it's infinite, so Toeplitz operator. Then you could cut, uh, of course. Maurice, uh, Maurice yeah. is, is the diagonal in the B plus or the B minus? This doesn't matter. It you, doesn't matter. You, you can, uh, you can choose it. You can, you can uh, actually, uh, in this, I mean, it does matter in the sense that uh, you have to make a choice. Um, in the, uh, and sometimes you have to take it in one and sometimes in the other, or sometimes you have to sort of divide one to the other. This depends on, on, on the situation. We have situations, for example, in my paper with Ross on the CUE, that we make a choice. We put part in B plus and, and a part in B minus, and then the commutator is trace class. But if you would make another choice, mm. it would not be trace class. So uh, in your, your assumption, you are not saying that B itself is trace class. So this term, the sum of BJJ might, no, might, be of, uh, might be bounded. It might be, it might be growing. It, it does that yes. matter? So it could actually be even, uh, it can actually even be, uh, let me see, it can even be, but for example, the Toeplitz matrices, it will be bounded, right? So the operator is bounded, right? But, uh, but it's not trace class, yeah. And also B plus and B minus are not trace class because if they yeah. would be trace class, then the trace of this commutator would be zero. Yeah. Right, yeah. so that's actually a part, important part of this theorem. So this sum from Jekyll one, so that's, uh, uh, that's, uh, it could be growing, it could not be growing. We allow for both cases. Yes, yes. And it should be one-sided, yes. Uh, one-sided banded. That is something that is important. And actually, so in my, the first proof of the statement, or not really of this statement, but it was almost the same. This was uh, in my paper with Jonathan, and then it was really for bounded operators. It was important that everything was bounded uh, and banded also, actually. But in our <laughs> recent paper, um, um, yeah. So I just want to go back. Is that uh, if you can put the diagonals uh, either on the plus side or the minus side, uh, I guess that won't. Uh, this is still a well well defined sum, right? It, it doesn't matter. The sum of BJJ is just B, right? So I was just yes. worried for a moment there might be some ambiguity. No. Sorry. So actually, one of the things that we did recently is to actually also allow for sort of unbounded matrices. This was the problem, actually, when you go to multiple orthogonal polynomials, things might actually get quite unbounded. Um, and so we proved this actually using the uh, baker campbell hausdorff formula. That is actually what is behind this theorem. So that is actually uh, an interesting maybe feature of the of this statement that I want, just want to mention. Okay, so if B is a is a is a Toeplitz operator, then you can just simply cut it off. You can take the B plus to be like A0 and A1 and A2 and so on, and zero here, and B minus is actually then just B minus B plus. That's just the rest. You could also have put the diagonal at the other side, but that's okay. And then actually the B plus, the commutator of the B plus and the B minus is a trace class operator under certain assumptions on the on the on the on the on the coefficients and the trace of this is going to be nothing else than k times a k times a minus k so as long as this somehow this half subalab norm of the symbol is, is finite this and this this is true this is correct right so and this is basically a trace it's not really the strong sacred limit theorem but it's a variation to that okay so the template's case is actually a good case to 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 keep in mind now this still, these conditions are very strong and way too strong to give, for example, central limit theorems for unitary ensembles. Because typically, if you look at these Jacobi operators for general orthogonal polynomial ensembles, they will not satisfy this condition. It's too strong. But there is actually a, a very beautiful second theorem that will help you out. Um, and that is the following. So there's a theorem B 
that says that if you have two, ba two matrices, B, and actually you could allow your B to even vary with N. So you can look at varying ensembles also, right? So you can let your uh, things vary. And then we have a special B, let's call it tilde, such that uh, B tilde satisfies the two assumptions above, one and two from, uh, from, from theorem A. And we also know that Bn, and this is a Bn, if I look at the difference between Bn and B tilde, around the n entry, if this goes to zero, as n goes to infinity, for all uh, j and k, if you have that, which actually, let me say what that means. So here I have B, so that's a matrix. If it's around the n entry here, so these are the entries that sit here, and then I have a tilde B tilde, which is also a matrix, would be very different from this first matrix, but around the N entry, they look the same. If they look around the N entry the same, then I can actually compute the phi N of B, this determinant for B, and it will be the exponential of the sum of the B J, J, J is one to N, just the usual term. But then I get the second term, and here it's just this B tilde plus B tilde minus here, the trace of that. And then it's one plus small o of one as n goes to infinity. So here it says something universal. If, if you can, if you have a B tilde right here, that you decompose as a B, B tilde plus and a B tilde minus upper and lower triangle such the commutator is trace class, then all matrices that around the N entry look the same as your the special matrix actually satisfy the same central limit theorem. So this case is of course the global uh, distribution of eigenvalues that could be very different and is case dependent, but this is a universal term. So the combination of the two will give you a, uh, a central limit theorem for, so if you could do this, the theorem A for a B tilde, then you can do it for all Bs that you can compare B tilde with. And, and this has a corollary. Let me say, let me, let me show this in a corollary. Uh, so let me, let me say that's an example. If I would look now at these, uh, at these, these examples, x j, x minus j squared here, I mean the, the Coulomb gases, the unitary ensembles. Then actually, if you would assume that, that and this is just an example, the, the mu x is like just absolutely continuous on and uh, with support of the measure is on an interval. So it's b minus two a to b plus two a. And the W of X here is always positive on that, on that interval without further uh, regularity assumptions. So W is just positive on that interval. It's just an absolutely continuous measure. So no analyticity or anything. Then actually the denisov rachmanov theorem says that your coefficients AN and BN, that they will actually have limits that they converge. That's what the denisov rachmanov theorem says which basically means that your J matrix around here will just look like B and A here, and that's it. And then the, and, and around this N entry, we'll just get these things. Uh, and what is in the beginning is not really important for us, right? So what I'm saying here is that for those matrices, the combination of theorem A and theorem B says that you can actually compare it to the Tuplitz matrix with symbol uh, the Tuplitz matrix with a symbol, actually, if you want to do it with an F, is going to be AZ plus B plus AOA on over Z. So that you could take for your B tilde. And if your B is, is F of J, oh, that's just, if your B is F of J, uh, then the B tilde can be chosen to that. Now, for this case, we know a central limit theorem. We actually have the, uh, the, 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 the variation of to the strong single limit theorem. We know how this behaves. Therefore, we also know how this behaves. And this gives a central limit theorem for unitary ensembles for general measures that go beyond like integrability. So 
so that's maybe not a good example for this particular seminar, but actually it shows that you have a central limit theory for global scales that, that go beyond uh, integrability. You don't use any uh, methods that require like asymptotics for kernels and so on. Yeah, uh, Maurice, could you just explain again why this, uh, it seems that B tilde, if you go up a little bit, is not, yep. uh, not uniquely determined, yet your solution requires the whole of B tilde. I mean, I could change B tilde in, in one entry, say, and still have the condition that uh, this is true as N and J, you, you know, your condition between B and minus B tilde goes to zero. I could change B tilde at some, at, N equals 50, 51, right? And right. But nevertheless, that whole thing appears in here. Yes. So th that com comes back that we have a trace of a commutator. So you are, if you change only one entry, that is, a, of course, a finite rank perturbation, that will change maybe your B plus in a finite rank. But then that actually, then you can use the cyclicity of the trace. So that trace is actually zero. Right, so if you know that we, we, we do have that the trace of A, B equals the trace of B, A, if either one of them is, if either A and or B is, is, is trace class. So if you change only one entry, you basically get like the trace of B plus, and we just add maybe one entry. So let's call that C. And then I'm take the commutator with, with B minus, then here you get a trace of B plus B minus plus the trace of C with B minus. But this part here would be zero because C is just a finite rank operator. Okay. But of course I could change B, uh, B tilde more than at just one place. But, uh... Yes. Um... The change could be not just a finite rank change, right? Yeah, but you you have to also be. I mean, it's also here. I write also for all j and k, right? So this 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 box here could also be of arbitrary size. So you don't have so much. Um, I mean, you basically your 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 b is will be. I mean, you just. I mean, if you shift your n entry to be the center and then you let things grow, then you do get sort of like one, only one choice for your B, right? B tilde. Mm -hmm. And actually, if you change more, I mean, basically part of the statement is so actually what you do is that if you look at again here, the, 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 the problem at the beginning is that, so basically what I'm saying here is that all the entries of B Right, so that is, that is around the n entry. This is exactly where you're cutting things off, right? So there, if B would be an n, n, n by n matrix, then we can also easily compute the determinant of e to the B. It's just e to the trace of B. So basically there where you're, you're, basically you're taking your exponential, there where you cut it off, you get all kinds of cross terms. Like if you could split your B in, 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 in this way, there was only entries here and only entries there then the whole problem is trivial. So there are some entries that are here, but there are not so many of them. And it's exactly those entries that actually give you the correction to the trace of B. Okay. I have to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yep. So maybe actually this is a good point because um, if there are to have actually some questions about this first part, I will go to the second part that will talk about these multiple orthogonal polynomials. So maybe we take a short break of a few minutes. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So uh, we'll we'll take a break for about five minutes and then resume. Yep. Okay. okay. Good. 